Hello, everyone. Welcome to 360 Degrees Excellence, where we believe everyone can achieve all around success. Today, I'm going to be having a conversation with Dr. Patrick Katoto. And we're going to talk about uh, COVID-19 uh, truths and lies. There's so many falsehoods, many conspiracy theories going around. Uh, but we want to focus about the truths. We are going to talk about some lies. Uh, so without wasting time, uh, I'm going to start. So the first question I'm going to be asking is for my guest. Doc, can you just tell us about yourself? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Tosin, and uh, good afternoon to all your viewers. Uh, I, I'm very happy to, to be part of uh, the list of your guests today. So, uh, you know, that question is every time very hard to, to respond. But uh, what can I say? In the past 10 years, um, I've been, you know, moving between clinics, activities, uh, teaching and research. And so I started my career as a clinical assistant in the DSC where I'm coming from. Uh, and there is a general a junior general doctor. I've been moving around surgery room, pediatrics, gynecology, you know, repairing like uh, all the wound from civil war and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm proud of touching like everything, you know, and I've been like a basic for my career. And uh, after that, I've been now fixed in one department, internal medicine, where we treat lung disease, cardio, uh, heart disease, infectious disease. And I've been mainly positioned on uh, treating lung disease and infectious disease. And uh, my major achievement at that time was actually to be able to treat or to support the HIV clinics around my province and, uh, you know, to give advice. It was extraordinary to see how people, you know, a guy arriving in your office, he doesn't know why he was losing the weight, 30 kilo, and, uh, you know, you diagnose him with uh, either HIV or both co-infection, HIV and TB, and then you give him just IIV, antiretroviral uh, therapy and antitoberculosis. After two years, you see the guy can, you know, oh, kind of oh. resuscitate it, starting life. And that was yeah. quite amazing to see how uh, art treatment have changed life, uh, uh, you know, and our view considering uh, HIV. From there, I got a scholarship to go now to get some advanced studies in internal medicine, and uh, that was in Brussels. Uh, and there I was right in general internal medicine, but focusing on something that I didn't do in the DRC, and that was uh, hematology, hematology that is uh, disease, blood diseases. And where I touched something like uh, a bone marrow transplantation, and mm. it quite amazing to see how you can treat cancers, blood cancers and stuff, how you can even for some diseases like a sickle cell anemia, how you can achieve a success of treatment via transplantation. And that was quite amazing. And from there on, I actually met my boss there who was publishing like uh, every month, one, two, Ooh. three papers. And uh, I was with zero papers so far, and it was kind of motivation. What is going on? And uh, I tried actually uh, three drafts, but I never published them. It was very <laughs> hard, very, very hard. <laughs> and uh, at least I published one abstract mm. that have been accepted in the Congress, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I was very proud of it. And, uh, you know, from there on, I decided to learn about researcher. And uh, I understand that you can't just come and say, okay, I am a researcher. You need to learn. 
yeah. at least the basic and the basic of such as methodology. Yeah. So I moved in, uh, in South Africa uh, at Stellenbosch University where I did a master's of methodology, actually research and methodology, but you call it clinical epidemiology, where you learn to design clinical study, observational study or interventional studies and where also you learn to do what we call researcher synthesis. Now, like kind of pulling every, all the data we have to pull them, them together and to be able of grading the evidence to inform policy or you know, hospital um, management, et cetera. So I spent two years at Stellenbosch doing that. Mm. And uh, I produced, I, they are working on uh, HIV, again, again, but now a kind of a mixing of HIV with non-communicable disease, yeah. uh, cardiometabolic disease such as yeah. diabetes, uh, cholesterol, high cholesterol, you know, that we call dyslipidemia, you know, all the trouble of, uh, of, of lipid or cholesterol, uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, that we can have among people with HIV. As I said, it has been, Terrific to see how this has has you know have been ev uh, evaluating during the time before people with HIV didn't you know uh, the life expectancy was very short but now with R now, they yeah. to live long and now they long. start developing some diseases so mm. now we have to learn if mm. that kind of disease they have is it different with people without, uh, uh, HIV. You know, without HIV, does it just related to HIV or to the IRV itself yeah. or just with the other traditional? Hmm. Uh, There's a lot of problems to consider. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's it's, interesting. It's and I can uh, see that, I can see yeah. that you, you know, have passion for research. You, you eventually, you did your PhD uh, and um, now you continue to do research. And um, I'm sure you must have done research uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, do you want to share with us uh, maybe some of your findings? Yeah. Uh, you know, when COVID-19 uh, has been declared as a, a pandemic in March last year, yeah. No one didn't know COVID-19, you know. <laughs> we didn't know, it. we didn't know something about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So everyone started, uh, I was in Boston on a Congress mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that was canceled because of COVID. So mm -hmm. there had been an outbreak of COVID somewhere and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we have been panicking everyone. So from there, we start going in the history of what we know about MERS viruses, about the other SARS, uh, vi I mean, the COVID, like uh, uh, the SARS-1 vi COVID-1 virus. And uh, it was going to, we started with the similarities. It's the similarities like, you know, we know it's an airborne disease trans tr transmission or not, can it be like tuberculosis? Can it be like flu yeah. or whatever? And from there on, we start to pulling everything together. And my first, uh, my first thing was to understand, trying to understand. Uh, I, I'm not like as senior as it is yeah. to start pulling hypotheses, but I'm trying, I first try to understand. And uh, directly the, there was a, a very, package uh, uh, online uh, uh, materials or, or certificate, advanced certificate on COVID-19 at Berkeley University. And I took it. I took it because it combined 14, uh, 14 uh, you know, modules and or themes. And there, from there, I understand what COVID-19 actually was about vaccine process, about you know, epidemiology, mechanistic and stuff. So my first work was first to teach also others. So yeah. in the network of um, infectious control uh, network in Africa, what they call ICANN, together with CDC Africa, so the Center for Disease and Control in Africa, we started planning, you know, teaching 
uh, uh, health workers about COVID prevention and stuff. That and so far we have trained more than four thousand person. So that was my big achievement uh, about mm. COVID nineteen, and I'm very happy to be part of that. And then some research that I've been doing was focused on the knowledge. What do we know? What the population knows about, about COVID-19? Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. we did a lot of research, especially in the DRC, uh, and try to, you know, to advise some uh, political leaders about it. Yeah. What we have found in those, in those studies is that the population were not actually concerned about, uh, about COVID-19 itself, but they were concerned about you know, uh, um, economic insecurity. So that yeah. was the big challenge. Uh, and, uh, you know, and our role now was about to try to find the best way to communicate, but the big problem was about communication. So how to communicate the risk, you know, in DLC, you know, we have all those kind of e diseases such as Ebola, but people yeah, yeah. were yeah. not like scared about, you should oh, expect that they will be able to understand, <laughs> but they could just understand why they have to close schools, but not markets. Mm -hmm. But public mm -hmm. market are just there open, but mm -hmm. they close schools. Yeah. And sometimes politicians are still arguing in the parliament. So. It was quite, kind, kind of that, that our work uh, as researcher to try to be in the middle and try to conciliate that. And you know, you see this and this, this is the risk and try to find strategies how to communicate that risk uh, among vulnerable population or target the risk that we have been identified via the researcher and uh, who actually being unskilled or uneducated, or you know, not having a stable job, those were like um, the predictors of not being, you know, able of understanding and the risk related to COVID. Yeah. That yeah. was in one part. On the other yeah. part, uh, I've been doing a research synthesis on uh, because part of my study of my research interest is also to see how we connect actually is to put the bridge between communicable disease and non-communicable disease and emerging risk factors such as air pollution. Yeah. And I am actually focusing in Africa, the kind of air pollution in Africa that we have is especially biomass food smoke. So, uh, I was trying to see the link to summarize all the researchers so far that we have in a kind of systematic review and to see what do we know? How does uh, exposure to air pollution influence the epidemiology of COVID-19 worldwide? Yeah. So uh, uh, what I found and the paper is under review. Uh, for great. now, I hope to be published soon. Yes, but that's the, first, that's the first comment was quite nice. And uh, okay. what we have found so far, we have like a uh, uh, hundred of hundred of studies that have been published mm. worldwide. Yeah. But yeah. the quality is not very yeah. nice. Why? Because they have been using aggregated data. So individual level data, you know, were missing. And from there, we can't actually draw the causality. So we, uh, the main recommendation, yes, we see there is kind of risk association between being exposed to pollution, like uh, biomass fuel smoke uh, used for domestic energy, like you know diesel exposed, traffic related air pollution, all those increase the risk of air pollution especially yeah. after being chronically exposed. But I will say that for now, the level of evidence is quite low. And uh, that's our major recommendation for the, the, the public. So that, that was the second yeah. part of my research yeah. in COVID. And the last one is now to see how COVID-19 
has impacted on other achievement that we have gained in Africa on health system. Yeah, yeah. So how does it impact utilization of other service, curative service in different countries? How does it impact on the treatment of tuberculosis? That is one example, like in Niger, we just published a paper uh, that it's quite uh, unbelievable that people, you know, that children, children didn't receive their uh, vaccination, you know, during like, I will say that the level of uh, um, vaccination did decrease. The rate of yeah. vaccination did decrease at uh, on a spectacular rate. And that is very concerning for children. You know that the first cause of, of mortality uh, in Africa for children who have malaria, we have lung diseases, etc. Yeah. But if they the don't morning. receive vaccine, yeah. Yeah. voila, if they don't receive uh, a vaccine for like uh, that vaccine that protect them for getting severe mm. pneumonia, mm. you see what we will have more depth even compared to that will that will, that we expect to be associated to yeah. COVID knowing that children are quite, you know, are less likely to die with, uh, uh, from, with COVID, but they are more likely of dying with pneumonia, but we are losing that. So that is our call to say, okay, we have to work now with the commun communities. You know, we have to work with the communities. If people are scared in many countries, it can be in Europe, in America, or in, Africa, mm. people are scared to go to the health facilities. So how can we strengthen our health system so as we can bring, you know, all those products to the community by using the community, such as, mm. you know, train more health workers, train like uh, using clinical mobiles. So, you know, we can go vaccinate people in, uh, it has been like the same with bed nets. Uh, we know that if children, we don't have vaccine for malaria, unfortunately, but yeah. sleeping in a bed net, that is yeah. very important. It reduces yeah. a lot, a lot the, you know, yeah. the likelihood of getting uh, malaria. So yeah. we need it. We, we couldn't delay that, but it has been delayed some in yeah. some countries. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. there is a way you can use community Mm. by respecting all the distancing measures for COVID, masking and stuff, and bring mm. that. Yeah. And the other That's one is now on... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. You've done a lot of research. I'm so excited about what you're yeah. doing. Because we need to see a lot of research output coming from Africa. You know, On COVID-19, I've been seeing a lot of articles from China, from other countries. But you guys are, you are doing a lot of work. And I hope to see some of those uh, articles published. But more important than publishing them is just you guys are making an impact, especially what you said you did in uh, DRC and also being able to advise the government. And the challenge we have in Africa is that um, uh, a lot of governments don't really have enough uh, capacity. You know, like in South Africa, when there was um, a lockdown, the lockdown had to be relaxed because government could not give, you know, social grants to a lot of people. Like what happened in the US? Some of them were paid maybe $1,000, you know, most households. So that's, that's a problem in Africa. How do you balance, you know, uh, health security and also, like you mentioned, economy security, you know, how do you balance it? Public health and uh, you know, food security, all those things, you know, that's a challenge in Africa. And you also mentioned something that you, that really, you know, caught my attention about vaccination, you know, for kids. It, it appears we're focusing on um, COVID-19, which is very, very important for us, to, you know, uh, to think about, but we must never forget that there are other diseases out there that people still have. Nobody's really talking about so much about HIV and AIDS again. Nobody's talking so much about tuberculosis. But all these diseases are, are still there, you know. You guys are really doing wonderful, wonderful research. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> so, but I have this question for you. Yeah, I have this question for you. I have this question yeah. for you. What do you say 
So people that are concerned about COVID-19 vaccine, a lot of people are concerned. There was a time I shared on Facebook about a billionaire in Nigeria that decided to procure uh, COVID-19 vaccines for a lot of people. And somebody was like abusing him that, um, why should I be supporting that kind of initiative? What do you say to people that are scared about um, COVID-19 vaccines? Yeah, that is really quite tricky. And I'm reflecting on a paper with a colleague. <laughs> and how to, you know, it will be, the title of the paper will be Vaccine Crisis. Hmm. Nationalism versus hesitancy. Hmm. In hmm. one hand, we have a global crisis of getting, you know, vaccine. You know, the, the general platform that the WHO, WHO is putting together with more yeah. than 190 countries and now we will have 91 because yeah. Joe Biden, yeah. President Joe Biden want to come back Mm. that they call the COVAX facilities. Yeah. The big problem is those wealthy countries are buying a <laughs> lot of vaccine and at giving high prices for them. So their population can be vaccinated and the yes. economy, yeah. you know, regain. Yeah, so yeah. We are calling vaccine nationalism. Yeah. So they are trying to yeah. buy everything for their population. Cost. And now you have some people queuing, complaining, they're taking long on the queue and the government getting a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. They want to buy everything. But in the COVAX facilities, mm. every country actually has its courts. You, know? you have to get this minimum compared to your population, this percentage compared to your population. So that is one hand. On the other hand, there is vaccine hesitancy that you are saying, talking about. Mm. Yeah. And in many low and middle income countries where people actually don't want to get vaccine. And of course, they don't even have that vaccine. <laughs> that is the first thing. They even don't have it. So yesterday, we have a meeting on, uh, uh, at Columbia University where Dr. Tedros, uh, the DG, the Director General of the WHO, was again calling about, you know, compassion, how people should, those wealthy countries shouldn't buy all the vaccine available on the market. Like for now, half of vaccine produced are distributed, you know, in two countries, the US, the UK. So what about others? Look at the struggle we have in South Africa. You know, they mm. bought the the AstraZeneca yeah. vaccine. Yeah, AstraZeneca. And that's AstraZeneca. come mm -hmm. that it come, it happened that it's you know it's inefficacy, only 22% against the, the new variant here, the 501YV2. So they have now to buy new vaccine, yeah. Johnson yeah. And Johnson. And yeah. you see how the president have been like, you know getting problem on the, yeah. on the parliament. Yeah. So that's in one part of Africa, but what the other part of Africa <laughs> where people, the vaccine hesitancy still. So first we have to go at that level to see what is going on in the other countries. So people are rushing to get vaccine and they are finishing even the vaccine on the market. So that's the first mm. thing. The second thing, why most of people in Africa don't want to get uh, vaccine, first they say, okay, they are trying those conspiracies, they're trying to mm. kill us. Okay, who is trying to kill you? This time we thought that because that was the projection, I think the first study is that projecting projecting a catastrophe, an apocalypse in yeah. Africa. Okay, they say, okay, they will bring us the disease, so as we die a lot, mm. and then they will give us that vaccine. But when you see the difference is even increased in, in the US, in Europe at that time. Yeah. So no one is coming to kill African. And the vaccine this time, it has mm. been tested everywhere, not only in Africa. So that's mis, that was also misleading that have been claimed. Now mm. we have different vaccine that have been getting the license in the pipeline. 
so far. So the question is, why are we worried again? Because that vaccine is now given to white people also in the UK, in the, in the, in the America, and look, Pope Francis have got his, uh, his job, his vaccine doses. President Joe Biden has got his vaccine. The Queen Elizabeth has got his vaccine. Who am I now to refuse the vaccine? But still the oh. same vaccine. The same vaccine. That is, that is the other level of saying. Yeah. yeah. So, and the last, I've asked, uh, uh, I got a conference uh, to some students uh, of medicine in one, uh, in one university and asked them, guys, the other medicine that you have in Africa, where do they coming from? All those vaccines you you all have got that when we were kids. Yeah, when you were that kids. Giving to your kid, where are they coming from? I think not in Nigeria, not in Rwanda, not in Ghana. So it's mm. coming from somewhere, from mm. AstraZeneca, from Johnson and Johnson and stuff. If someone wants actually to kill you, he will not going to tell you. Yeah, he will have been killed some time ago. He will use uh, the other vaccine. Mm. And, uh, you know, look the exportation we have, uh, the importation we have in Africa. Every, you know, three quarters of stuff coming from outside. So if someone wanted to kill you, he will kill you before that. Yes. So <laughs> the, last, the last take on that is fact now. Let's speak fact. Yeah. Vaccine will kill us, and some videos are passing in the social media and stuff. We're getting cold and stuff. And I, I say, okay, that's, let's see the fact. So far, COVID have killed how many people? Million of people. And so far, vaccine have killed how many people? Let's say 50, 50 mm-hmm. people around the world. Mm. So what do you choose? Yes, what do you choose? Something that <laughs> killed 50 people. Or something that killed million of person. So it's quite easy to choose. Yes. And if you want to be uh, uh, to understand, okay, let's say which which drug that doesn't have side effect. Allergic, yeah, allergic reaction. There's no, yeah, yeah. there is none. There's none. Otherwise, yeah. you never. It's it not. It's not milk. Even milk, yeah. if you take milk. Excess yeah, too effect. much. Yeah. Side effect. Mm. See? So side effects can arrive on paracetamol, on aspirin, on you mm. know everything. Antibiotics, they have side effects. And I've mm. seen people dying with side effects of everything. Mm. So if you see a video of one or two persons getting mm. side effects, it is still okay. But if you see millions of people who are dying yeah. with COVID, how the as a business have been, you know, closing, how COVID has impacted. That's what we are saying now, the collateral effects of COVID pandemic on our world. So if we need to open the economy to, you know, the business, we need vaccine. And I think there is no risk. There is, a, there is no reason of, of being worried because we have been cleaning all those false, all those false facts are saying yeah. they're coming to kill to kill us. So most of them didn't occur in Africa. They are coming to test those vaccines on us. No, most of uh, vaccine have been tested outside Africa. They are going to give us all those vaccines. No, as a country are even trying to buy those buy that have been. Res- <laughs> And they have, yeah. they have started. Yeah. If you think that it's killing people, no, you have to compare. Look the facts. We have yeah. less than 50 people who has, uh, you know, who has died with, uh, with vaccine, less. But you have to compare yeah. now people who has died with uh, COVID-19 everywhere. So uh, that's my take yeah. on that. And yeah, I- thanks so much. Thank, thanks so much for, for- uh, throwing more light to that question, you know, very, very important for people to know that vaccine is okay. You should take it. At the moment, it's not even available. Once it's available, please take the vaccine. We took vaccines in the past, you know, small pause, measles, 
yellow fever. We've taken even poliomyelitis that has just been eradicated because of um, vaccination that was you know, initiated by Bill Gates and Melinda uh, Foundation, you know. So vaccine is very, very important. That's how we can really overcome this pandemic. But you see, the world did not prepare for this pandemic. They didn't prepare, it caught us on the way. And um, how can we prepare? I mean, do you have any advice how we can, because another one is going to come, another pandemic is going to come as a result of another virus. You know, we remember what happened, this plan, Spanish flu that happened about 100 years ago that really killed millions of people. So definitely there's going to be another pandemic that is coming, but how can we prevent, how can we or reduce the number of people that will die? I think, you know, that's my question now. Yeah, that's very critical. That's what we are calling global health. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Yeah. And in global health, we have a brand that we are calling global health security. Global health security, okay. In the global health security, we need to, we know, unfortunately or fortunately, we know all those microbes susceptible mm. of working, you know, outbreaks, yellow fever, Lassa fever, yeah. Ebola, yeah. all this kind of SARS, we all this cholera and stuff. We know this uh, antibiotics resistance, etc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All those diseases that can cause global treats from simple outbreak to epidemic and pandemic, so we need to prepare. How to prepare? The first thing is to know. But no one can, can prevent it himself. It needs to be a global effect. Right. That's where we need strong leaders, mm. starting from G7, mm. and pose the AU at continental level. So at the global level, we need that G7. It's, it's quite interesting how now the US is coming, is back. Yes, yeah, coming that. back. It's yes, very, back. very, very important to see how they are working together. It's very important, that one, mm. because those guys actually dictate say, all the politics, especially by supporting the WHO. Mm. At the continental level in Africa, especially, that AU, we need to have strong leaders who understand that can prevent also. And that's have been really, really missing for the AU component, the prevention. For now, they have now what they call CDC Africa. So the Center for Disease and Control Prevention of Africa. Now we have it. And leading by uh, a very good doctor from Nigeria, John Kengerson. Very nice. And uh, we hope that will be, uh, that is a very, very first step for preventing yeah. those kind of disease of global treats. Now from continental level, we have to, we should have those CDC countries now, mm. CDC mm. Nigeria, CDC Nigeria, we should have mm. CDC Morocco, CDC Nigeria, mm. CDC Buti, you know, that will be reporting to the CDC Africa. Mm. But who, unfortunately, the one who is supporting even the CDC Africa, money is coming from the US, from mm. the Euro centuries. So this is now I think the, the call for African leaders, you know, to invest in health. In many countries, you have like for health budgets, less than 3% in many countries, less than 5%. Look, when we started with COVID, the first beginning of sample, blood sample should come, or let's say uh, the, 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 not blood sample, but sample should come from from Ethiopia to be tested in South Africa. Mm. Because we were not able to test that. Mm. If you adjust that sample in, in, Niger, in, Niger, in, in Niger or in Egypt, we were easy to bring them in South Africa. Mm. Because at least the, the, the National Institute of uh, you know, Communicable Disease, the NICD, that have been empowered. So that's what we need. 
at national level to empower those labor advanced laboratories for surveillance. And at national level, now we need to go at provincial level or local level in each country. Let's say you are in a province in, in DRC, in the east of DRC, 2,000 kilometers, you know, to reach the capital city in Kinshasa. But when the first case uh, occurs in, uh, in, in, in that part of the country, you need it to bring sample to be analyzed, you know, at 2,000 kilometers. And for those diseases that uh, have a high fatality rate, when the feedback will come, the <laughs> patient will be dead. I'll die. You see, so this is a time uh, to bring all leaders, I think, for now. Yeah. I mean, science have been doing well so far. Scientists are aware, they know what to do, but they're not funding. So politics, stop a little bit on uh, you know, doing yeah. only yeah. politics. But they should now try to build capacity to give all they need or to give scientists all they need. You know, our countries, they have, we have really very, very good scientists. You can find them everywhere. Nigeria, mm. Nigerian researchers, Congolese, Senegalese, mm. yeah. Kenya, everywhere. But except in Africa. Hmm. Why? Because you have knowledge, but research and need money. You need money to do research. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You need money. Yeah. And I think it's time for African leaders to bring, to invest in research now, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Research is very, very important. And you also made mention of um, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It's very, very important for us to have uh, such centers in all African countries reporting to, to the one in um, AU and also AU uh, center last with all the continental uh, centers. Very, 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 very important for people to work together because we've seen what has happened. It started from China and it's spread across all countries of the world. So we must, we must work together and it's also very important for people to begin to predict using all this uh, machine learning language, uh, using artificial intelligence to begin to predict what could happen and to also even begin to look at uh, developing vaccines. You know, we can get some of these um, viruses from some animals because uh, I, I read that maybe it came from pangolin. Some people also said maybe it came from bats. So we can begin to look at some of these vaccines, begin to even produce vaccines from some of these um, animals. You know, it's all about, you know, releasing res money to do research, to do more research on vaccines and things like that. It's very, very important. And um, I've learned a lot from our discussion today and I've had a wonderful time. Uh, what's, what's your closing remark for us today? Yeah. First of all, say thank you for having me on. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I will say that we have a very long route for as, as African. Mm. Uh, we are learning a lot, but we still have to learn a lot. Mm. We still have to learn a lot, and uh, it's very important that young researchers, regardless of limited opportunities they have that should keep working hard. Uh, what I've learned in, my, in the past 10 years, uh, network is very important. Mm. And if actually you want research, try to publish at least one paper. You don't know until you measure something. That's the only thing I'll say. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like that. You also mentioned the case of collaboration. Collaboration is very, very important. If there's one thing I've learned, is that you need to work with people. I always tell my students about synergy. Uh, even scripture says one will chase a thousand, 
10 with goods, 10,000 to flee. The power of uh, collaboration is awesome. You know, if there's one thing I want to do more is to collaborate with people, you know, and um, I also encourage young researchers to, to do that. Don't think only about working alone. When you work with people, you look at the problem from another perspective that will make the work to be more robust. Then it's also very, very important for you to also value interdisciplinary mm -hmm. research, work with people that are in other areas because system thinking allows us to solve the problem better. And um, interdisciplinary research is all about system thinking. Yeah. I really, I really, I really support that. And um, I'm so happy, Doc, Patrick, for finding time out of your busy schedule to do this interview with me. I'm sure our viewers must have learned a lot from today. And to our viewers, thanks for watching. And we want to hear from you. We just want to tell you that let's listen to our health officials and our government and let's obey the rules. We all know those rules, wash your hands and obey physical distancing, uh, cover, your no, uh, uh, cover your face, let's obey all those things. And when the vaccine is available, let's grab it. Let's take the vaccine. I'm hoping that um, uh, 2021 is gonna be a better year for us in times of um, this um, pandemic. And um, I want to wish you a wonderful day ahead. See you next time. God bless you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.